Last week we talked about fear not. So we didn't need to talk about fear because that comes natural, right? It's the fear not we need to have a little bit of uh, help with. And it really started with a verse that God led me to through a devotional that I'm reading on version, and it was Isaiah 54.10, which reads, For the mountains may move and the hills disappear, but even then my faithful love, the word has said in uh, Hebrew, which means faithful, generous, and it's an act of love. It's not a feeling. It's like, I am doing this for you kind of love will remain. So even if we have the massivest earthquake and Mount Si disappears and Mount Rainier disappears, and can you even imagine that? But then God's love still remains. Same strength, same everything. So why be afraid? <laughs> the worst thing you can imagine could happen and God doesn't change. How great is that? So that's what we talked about. His covenant of blessing will never be broken, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. So that was last week. And this week, we're going to talk about the fact that we're still under construction. All that is great. We don't have to fear. And God's love is for us. And we're all done, right? <laughs> You're all done? <laughs> You're all done? Okay, good. <laughs> no, we're still under construction. We're going to be under construction until we get to go home. If you know Jesus, you're going to be under construction until you get to go home. So here's the warning. There's storms in life. <laughs> I know. There's this newsflash after newsflash around here, right? <laughs> so you see that. Like there's storms ahead. So maybe you're dealing with loved ones whose lives just seem to be on a roller coaster or spinning out. Or maybe you are having relational challenges. Or maybe your body just won't cooperate and you're just miserable. Or maybe you're dealing with emotional challenges and mental um, opportunities that are just uh, complicated and makes your life hard. Maybe it's finances. I bet there's a storm somewhere. And if you're lucky enough to be in that eye of the storm, you do know what's going to happen next, right? <laughs> Warning, there's a storm coming. It may feel peaceful, but then the rest of the hurricane comes through. Storms are just part of normal life. We get sunshine, but we get rain and storms as well. But God's love, his has said love, his active, generous love for us remains. That's the good news, right? So the good news, and to quote one of, one of my dear friends, God's got you. <laughs> right? God's got you. You do not have to worry. And got you in that case is spelled G-O-T-C-H-U. Right? <laughs> So then um, I was really wrestling this week because sometimes God's really kind and on Monday tells me, and he's kind all the time, but I, it feels kinder to me when I know on Monday. And then sometimes it's Saturday night and I'm like, hello, <laughs> um, let's have something tomorrow. And so in the devotional though, early in the week, there was just one verse that would not let me go. And it's coincidentally, are you catching this last verse? week's verse was Isaiah 54, 10. And this week's verse he uses is Isaiah 54, 11. Except I wasn't reading Isaiah 54. This was one devotional and a randomly completely different devotional. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, God. So today's verse is, oh, you afflicted one, storm tossed. We sing some songs about storms, right? Now we're gonna act in the storm. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm right? So, oh, you afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted. Sometimes when you're in a storm, it's just hard and you feel terrible, don't you? Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems, and this is God speaking, and lay your foundations with sapphires. With sapphires. So what is God saying? I don't know. If you, I, I don't live in the Midwest. I don't want to live in the mid Midwest, God. I don't want to live in the Midwest. <laughs> you know, I'll take earthquakes over, over tornadoes. Um, I know. <laughs> he knows. We've had this conversation multiple times. Um, a storm can take everything out, right? But this is what the verse says, that he will rebuild. He will rebuild. So no matter what, 
the storm as you're facing, no matter how hopeless or exhausting it feels, he is going to rebuild, he promises, and he cannot lie. So he will rebuild, but you know for him to rebuild, that means that something has to be torn down. You get it, right? If you got it all together, there's not a lot to rebuild. So God is gracious and tears some things down so we can rebuild, because I bet his rebuilding is better than our rebuilding. Would you agree with that concept? So do you have junk? Any junk in your life? <laughs> you know, and sometimes we put this nice facade over our junk, right? Or we shove it in the closet when the people come over, or we, you know, put panels in front of it, or whatever, right? We, we do something like this as if there's no junk, but God's like, I see you, and your outside may look wonderful, but there's some stuff on the inside, that I would really, if you belong to me, I really, and even if you don't yet belong to me, I really would like permission to take care of that. So the question is, do we know we have junk? These are trees on our property, and um, they look great, right? I mean, these trees look pretty good, pretty healthy, nice trees. They're hemlocks. I mean, if you know anything about trees, just me saying hemlocks should be enough for you to know some things because they're not the strongest trees. But these trees look good. But you know, we can't see what's underneath. I could look good. I could look like a strong tree having it all together. But I can't, you can't see how the core of me is doing. You can't see how my roots are doing. You don't know what's going on with the wood inside. And so underneath, These hemlocks needed to go because they were just, uh, they're dangerous trees actually. They're the ones that fall down in the middle of storms and these were close enough that they could do some damage. And so they were, they were yeah, so they were, yeah, these are pictures I actually took. So this was on Thursday. And so they're starting to take these trees down. And I hate taking trees down. Believe you me, I'm not the, take all the trees. I'm more, I don't want to let any trees go. But sometimes you have to be wiser, and this is a triple, so it's split, so it makes it even more dangerous, right? And so then you see all the broken pieces on the ground. So this is the illustration for our life. Sometimes God limbs us, right, and needs to strip us and take it down. But guess what? When this tree was all the way down, it was rotten. And when they actually felled it, the tree that was already a split tree just split, and it was rotten right at the base. So a good storm, it could have done some massive damage. We had another tree taken down, which looked really quite healthy. It was just in a bad location. They could have hurt some other things. And when it was down, I kid you not, there's a hole in the middle of the trunk. This big. How, do you, how long is that going to go good, right? The outside doesn't always tell us about the inside. So God has to tear something down for him to build it back up. And build it up, he promises. But be encouraged, he will rebuild. There is a prophecy in Isaiah 61 that talks about Jesus coming. He hadn't come yet, so it was still talking about the Savior coming. And the Savior saying, Jesus would be saying, the Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That's how the chapter starts. And then a few verses later it says, to console those who mourn in Zion. So to console his people, the people in the church, to console us, to give them beauty for ashes, right? So when that's broken down, when the storm takes stuff down, it might catch something on fire, you've got ashes, but those ashes, God will re build and make beauty for it. We even, that was even in one of the songs we sang. The oil of joy for mourning, because they used to anoint people with oil. We don't do that anymore. We don't like shining faces as much as they did. Um, the garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, d despair, depression. That's what the Savior, that's what Jesus came to do, to give all these things. This is how God wants to rebuild. He wants to take the broken and restore it with the good. Beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for depression. You know what the cure for depression and anxiety is? Praising God. 
even for the things that are bad. Not in spite of them, but for them. Because when you do that, the enemy has no room. If you praise him for the storm, whatever your storm is, it makes no sense. You don't feel like it. This isn't a like, yay! This is a... This is a sacrifice of praise. This may be on your knees crying. It may be curled up in a fetal position in your bed. But it's choosing to say, I praise you, God, for you are good. I praise you for these challenges because I know you're taking down the tree that looks so good to rebuild it into something that is good. And when we choose to praise God, it, gets freedom to work in ways that we can't imagine. Why? So that they may be called oaks of righteousness, strong trees, a planting of the Lord. Why? So that he may be glorified. So even if you think, but I've messed up, and I, you know, I'm just no good, and why would God do that for me? Well, listen to the end of the verse. Is he doing it for you? To the, it's for the display of his splendor. It's just so that he may be glorified. God likes to brag. I promise you, God is kind of a showy God. You know how we know this? Why would he create parrots? How about, how about a bird of paradise flower? What's the purpose for that flower? Other than being really showy. Rainbow, anyone? <laughs> I mean, God going, well, look at that, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's just some simple things. You start thinking, God shows off. He likes to show off. And you know who he wants to show off the most? His kids. I know someone who has a grandbaby who was showing off pictures this, just this morning, right? We like to show off what we're proud of. And God wants to rebuild us and to give us all this replacement so he can show us off, show off. You get it. And it's not just a minor touch-up when God gets to work. It really isn't. So back to the verse. Oh, you afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted. Behold, I will lay your stones with what? Colorful gems. And lay your foundation with sapphires. This is why this verse has stopped me this week. Because I never really caught that. That God's remodel isn't just with some rocks or some bricks or wood. Gemstones. When he's rebuilding me, he's using gemstones. If you didn't believe me before that he wants to show off, who puts sapphires in a foundation? <laughs> you do. But I mean, it's like, you know, you can't even see that. And would you put your gemstones on your house? I like prefer to wear my gemstones. <laughs> so that's what he says, gemstones. And the ones mentioned are ruby for the pinnacle, so for the roof, sapphire for the foundation, and beryl for the gate. So it's not just the foundation, it's the whole house, it's all gemstones. Crazy. Here's something I learned, well, and, and gemstones. They're beautiful, they're strong, they last, right? And they're valuable. As I was looking for pictures, I noticed one of the rubies, I think, just, it was a six carat ruby, but something like $350,000 for one ruby. It takes more than one ruby to build a house. You know what I mean? So, I mean, my gosh, God is serious. <laughs> but here's the other thing. We looked at it as storms, but another way to describe what God's building feels like is that he turns up the heat. You know, ever feel like, oh my gosh, I was kind of enjoying life, and now I feel like <laughs> I'm tap dancing. It's getting pretty hot. <laughs> and... Heat, you know what it does to gemstones? These specifically, actually, it's so interesting when I looked into this that there's all sorts of gemstones and a lot of them do not get heat treated. In fact, that would hurt them. But these three that are mentioned in this passage require heat to get what? More beautiful color and greater clarity. 
that just gives me chills. I don't know if it does for you, but God is turning up the heat not to hurt you, but to create a more beautiful you, a more beautiful color. Your blue is going to be a brighter blue. Your red is going to be darker and more beautiful. And beryl is really like uh, emerald comes from that, and aquamarine, and it becomes more clear, more vibrant. In, in fact, aquamarine, I believe, gets lighter from the heat. Um, I'm like, wow. So you don't like the heat in the middle of the heat. I bet if gemstones could talk, they'd say, yikes, you know, all sorts of chemical reactions are going on and this sucks. But, um, but then we're like, we polish them and go, look at that. <laughs> you know, now it's really pretty and that's what God's doing. I'd like to build your house with rubies and beryl and sapphire. So that you are amazing. And when people look at you and they're like, look at that building. Who built that? Because it's for his glory, not our glory. He's the one showing off, remember? But we have a part in it too. If you thought it was all easy, you just have to sit and let the heat take you. No, we've got a part. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, said, but let each take heed how he builds on it. He's talking about a foundation. And so basically... The, the apostles right after Jesus, right? The disciples became the apostles. They received instruction and taught the church. So they then taught others who taught others. And so they laid a foundation. And if you are a brand new believer and this is the place you came to know Jesus, then we've been laying a foundation, hopefully. And Paul is saying, for no other foundation can anyone lay than which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation we want to build on. This is true for us personally, the rebuilding. It's also true for the church. As a church, we're trying to build on the foundation that's been laid, Jesus, and the ones who've gone before us. We want to be built with the sapphires and the rubies and, and the beryl. We want to be shining, a shining church, a people on a hill in this case, right? Not so that we can go, look how pretty we are. No, so that people will be attracted to us so that they can be, be attracted to Jesus. Because sometimes we just have to be Jesus to people. So they can't meet him otherwise, right? And actually, I want to say, well done. You are doing a great job being Jesus to people. You really are. You really are. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the foundation. And our choice isn't like where we're going to build or what we're going to build on. If you're not building on Jesus, that's going to be challenging. But your choice is what you're building with. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 14 tells us this. Anyone who builds on that foundation, Jesus, may use a variety of materials. Here's your choices. You can use gold, silver, and jewels, gems, or wood, hay, and straw. But on judgment day, and here's the trick, right? It's not down here that we actually know whether it's made a difference. If your life is just about here and you live for today, you're going to have a rude awakening one day. Because on Judgment Day, this is when Jesus returns, either you expire, your time down here expires, you'll meet him, or he returns when we're still alive. On that and then judgment at some point. And for Christians, we don't have to fear judgment because we're not, it's not in or out. That's decided already once you've accepted Jesus. But on Judgment Day, your work is going to be evaluated. What did you do with what I gave you? <coughs> and fire, remember we talked about the gems being refined by that fire? Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's uh, work has any value. Gold, silver, gems, all get more beautiful, more pure with fire. Wood, hay, and stubble, however, goodbye. <laughs> so 
But the goodbye isn't that you aren't saved. The goodbye is that your work just didn't last, which means you come into Jesus' presence with nothing to offer him. I don't know about you. That's not my, that's not my goal in life. I want to come with something to offer, which I have to decide down here. I have to make choices down here. So how, how's your house built? How's your house built? You know, storms will come. And if you're building with wood, hay, and stubble, that's going to be your house. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. I would build your house using Jesus' plans. Here's where you, in Matthew 7, we can find that. He says, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. You know the hymn on who? Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So like a person who builds his house on solid rock, if you listen to his words and do them, though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. Unshakable. Unshakable. So we choose, what is that? We choose the word, we use, choose to know the word, obey the word. Praise is another place of how we build because it changes your insides. You could have come in grump, grumpy. You're praising Jesus. Something, some transaction happens on the inside. I don't ex understand it, but it happens. Prayer and community. Without those, it's hard to build. So there are some next steps. You know, what are you going to do from here? How are we going to be different? What about us? Well, since God keeps leading me back to Isaiah 54, I'm wondering if that's a place we should read. And then Matthew 7, 24 through 27 is all about building that house. You're going to build it on sand or you're going to build it on rock. So questions, are you in a storm? If not, just wait a minute. <laughs> It'll be back. Um, and will you, but will you choose to let God rebuild you? Being in a storm isn't, isn't the problem. That's going to happen. That's God's promise to us. But what will you let God do in the storm, through the storm, after the storm is the key? And will you choose, and this is an action step, to let God rebuild you? Maybe you've been through a storm. Maybe you're in the middle of it. And you've been resisting. You've been fighting. And maybe it's just to say, okay, God, you put the pieces back together. I cannot. And then will you do your part? Because we do have a part through listening to and obeying his word, praying, praising, and being in community. Without that, how do you survive it? I couldn't. In the middle of our biggest storm to date with, you know, our son being in heavy-duty addiction, if I hadn't had a community of people who prayed that I could send a prayer request to any minute, and if I hadn't learned these things, being in the word, and learned to praise in that process. That's when my process of, what, praising for bad stuff? Who does that? But we started doing that, and we started seeing things change. And then ultimately, do you know the real Jesus? Because none of this works if your foundation is sand. He promises to keep working. I love the verse in Philippians 1, 6, again, written by the Apostle Paul. God promises this, and he says, Paul says this, and I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, the moment you said yes to Jesus, that work started, he will continue his work until it's finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns, or you return to him. So it takes some action on our part to know the real Jesus, and here it is. One, admit that you need God. You can't do it on your own. You can't save yourself. <coughs> Two, believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Your sins. Everyone's sins, but yours specifically as well. On the cross and rose again. He didn't stay dead. And then thirdly, invite him as your Lord and Savior. Because it's a personal invitation. He is a gentleman. We had a knock on the door this, morning, or this afternoon. And he does stand at the door and knock. And we need to open that door and let him in if we want that. So pray with me. If you've done this before, then just remember your choice. If this is your first time, then just pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask you for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me and invite you to come into my heart and life. 
I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, for all of us, you know when the storms are coming. You know how long the storms are going to be, how severe the storms are going to be. You know exactly what's going to happen every day of our lives, and you have orchestrated it all. You are the creator, you are the redeemer, you are the rebuilder, and you do that with your gracious, generous, unrelenting love. And I pray that if we're in a storm and it's hard and we can't see, that you would be the one who holds us in that storm, surrounds us with people to get us through the storm, but let us say yes to the rebuilding project. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're going to do. And Lord, I can't believe that you rebuild with gems. What an amazing, flashy, wonderful, generous God you are. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, bless you. This is, this is part of our true hope sneezing. It's okay. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> it's a storm in the forest.